how did you feel? Like, I had Martin Kulldorff in here when he published Great Barrington Declaration. Um, and again, at the time, it was very much suppressed on social and on tech uh, platforms as well. Um, just questioning a lot of the actions and how they were made based on the information and the statistics so that ultimately, you know, people were dying of this virus, but usually because of older age and morbidities and these things like that. Um, how do you feel about the rollout of the vaccine and, you know, suggestions that children get it? And overall, how would you rate it out of 10? And will there be a book in the future about, you know, yeah. looking back through this? And maybe I'll ask this more of to know what we, what we can learn in the future about, yeah. to, about to do about these things. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bit chastened. I was not particularly anti-lockdown to start with. I thought well, maybe this is the only thing we can do. Maybe it did work in Wuhan. Uh, in China generally. Maybe the, Sw the Swedes are going to get a bloody nose by um, not going down this route. Uh, I now think the jury's in, and the jury says that Sweden was right. Jay Bhattacharya, Sinatra Gupta, and Martin Kuldorf were right, and the rest of us were wrong, uh, that compulsory lockdowns have killed more people than uh, the Swedish approach would have done. You know, Sweden has as far as I can make out, the lowest uh, excess deaths over the last three years of any country in the G, uh, G20, I think it is. Um, it's the OECD, actually, which is G27, as it were. Um, um, and I think Johan Anderberg's book, The Herd, on what happened in Sweden is a very important document um, proving that. And I think those who told me in voices of great authority when I would raise this during the pandemic that focus protection is not possible. You can't just protect the elderly. You either lock down everybody or nobody. We're wrong, frankly. I think that was a cheap and lazy thing to say. Uh, the evidence that uh, age was by far the most predictive factor of whether you died from this more important than obesity, more important than underlying conditions. Age was the the really big, you know, the graph is way steeper for, for, for um, old age, suggests that we could have devised policies that protected old people while allowing the rest of the world to go about its business and not had all the awful side effects, the medical side effects, but also the economic side effects uh, of locking down the world. Um, I think that's true. But you asked me about vaccines. Um, I think, uh, I, I really worry that this episode has oversold vaccines and has damaged their reputation. They are the most magnificent thing. You know, they have saved unbelievable numbers of lives, more than anything else with the possible exception of clean water um, over the last 200 years, you know, the first uh, you know, we eradicated smallpox with a vaccine. We've all but eradicated polio. Um, you know, measles, whooping cough, uh, typhoid, you know, etc., etc. Et it, it, it's extraordinary what's been achieved with vaccines. Yes, they've always carried risks, um, uh, but uh, compared with the risks, the benefits have been enormous. And when we started talking about vaccines for this disease, I was very worried that they wouldn't help much because it's been impossible to develop vaccines for the common cold. It's not been easy to develop vaccines that work for influenza very well. Um, partly because these viruses don't live inside the body. They live in the nasal mucosa and the, the, the lining of the lung where the immune system can't get at them. <laughs> so uh, making antibodies in the blood is not much help. But it does at least protect your blood against the virus going much more uh, sort of um, systemic and, and in infecting your whole body. And that's, of course, what they have proved to do. They've proved to save lives, but not to prevent transmission that much. So I think that's kind of in line with what we should have expected at the beginning. But to go around saying, you must take it, and if you don't, you're evil, and uh, even your kids must take it, even though they're not at very high risk of dying, is backfiring. I mean, it's feeding the anti-vax um, uh, uh, 
uh, a monster, <laughs> as it were. And you know, you're going to get people saying, "I'm not going to have a measles vaccine. I'm not going to have a rubella vaccine, etc." In the future, as a result of this. So, and I remember having a conversation with government ministers about this in the UK um, early on, and saying, "Look." I understand your your need to get to people who are hesitant about the vaccine and persuade them. Yeah, I'm all for trying, but please don't go and say they have no side effects, there are no risks, because that'll backfire on you, because of course there are a few risks. I mean, as far as I can see, the myocarditis risk is real but very small, much smaller than the myocarditis risk from, from COVID itself. Um, I know there are people who disagree with that, uh, but it, it's, um, uh, you know, I just hope we haven't thrown the baby of good vaccination out with the bathwater of um, vaccinating the wrong people in much too draconian and mandatory a way. Yeah, it's possible that we might have done that. Um, in 1986, I think in America, they removed liabilities for vaccines for big pharma, and I don't know all the details around that, but it was a step that potentially brought in a dangerous element to these, and when money is involved and lack of liability, sometimes the wrong decisions are made, as we can see a lot of the ones we're talking about today. Did, did that potentially, that act potentially take something that scientifically might be a great thing? I studied science as far as a vaccine and put it in the hands of people that might make a wrong decision with it or to move it along quicker because the liability isn't there and the potential profits are so high? I, I think that's that's definitely something that, that one could look at. And uh, it, it, you know, you can sort of see why you have to do something about liability because, um, you know, there's the swine fever story of the 1970s when they vaccinated a ton of people and uh, there was no big swine flu, uh, swine flu, not swine fever, um, outbreak. But quite a lot of people died of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which was a side effect of the vaccine. So, you know, that could have brought a pharmaceutical company to uh, bankruptcy, I guess. So, you, it's, it, you know, the, the, the economics of developing a vaccine are often very marginal. You know, if, if it's only... A, a disease that's affecting poor people, they're not going to buy it, you know, and so it's, you know, going to sell enough. If it works too well, you only do it once and then there's no continuing use. You know, what the, what the pharmaceutical companies really like is is a pill that you have to take for the rest of your life. Like a COVID booster. <laughs> like, but, well, exactly. And COVID boosters have come a bit to look like that. The, that is true. So, yeah, I think you're right that it's a consideration, but I think it's a, it's a difficult issue. It's a bit like... Uh, you know, removing the liability for nuclear power stations, uh, which governments on the whole did, uh, with the uh, because if they didn't do it, they'd never get built. But having done it, they get built in city centres or near big populations, which they probably wouldn't have been. Do you see what I mean? You know, yeah. so so um, uh, it, it, it's it's a difficult question. So Jim Rickards has just recorded a video that's not available to anyone in the public and he's going to be talking about how this upcoming recession is going to be fast, it's going to be bloody, it's going to be nasty. But at the same time, he's going to show you how you can position yourself to profit from all of this chaos. Now we've made this video only available to our viewers. Go to LondonReal.tv forward slash Jim, watch that immediately. I can't say enough good things about Jim Rickards. He understands the global economic system better than any guest I've ever had on London Real. His predictions are almost uncannily true, and you can learn how to profit from his vision, from his expertise, and his understanding of economics. So go to LondonReal.tv forward slash Jim or click the link below. It's an excellent, excellent look on what's going to happen in the future and how you can position yourself to profit from that. Jim is one of the best in the business, one of my favorite guests on London Real. And he's very, very good at predicting the future and showing us all to profit from it. So click the link and I hope you enjoy. The greedy bankers are about to do it again. In 2008, they crashed our financial system and nearly bankrupted the entire global economy. Then they received trillions of dollars in government bailouts. And after they demanded fat bonuses paid for by you 
the taxpayer. It turns out the banks haven't just been screwing the American taxpayers, they're also screwing over their investors. Turns out uh, the banking industry is the worst place you could put your money despite enormous taxpayer bailouts. Now the bankers are back to take away your financial freedom. They lie and tell you that cryptocurrency isn't safe. They try to make it illegal for you to choose how to invest your hard-earned money. They lie and say cryptocurrency is used by money launderers and criminals. But look at the record. It's the banks themselves that launder hundreds of billions of dollars every year to the biggest criminal operations in the world. Leaked documents have revealed how some UK banks have helped criminals, money launderers and Russians under sanctions. American authorities discovered that the Sinaloa cartel moved $881 million through HSBC accounts as bank officials turned a blind eye to the illegality. The bankers lie and say cryptocurrency is not a real investment. Meanwhile, the smartest CEOs in the world are buying billions and billions of it. The truth is that banks lie about cryptocurrency because it makes them scared. The banks take $9 trillion per year of your hard-earned money, and they are worried that they will finally be exposed. They're scared because crypto means they can no longer control your money, which means they can no longer control you. They are scared because you might actually understand your money and intelligently decide what to do with it. Now is the time for us to come together, fight back, and take control. It's time to educate ourselves, our families, and our communities. Because financial education means financial freedom. We know that cryptocurrencies will help us build the new decentralized financial system of the future. A banking system that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. A banking system where access to finance is a fundamental human right. A banking system that is free and fair and welcomes all humans on this earth. The DeFi revolution is happening. We, the people, can no longer be fooled. We choose to take control of our finances. We choose to take control of our freedom. We choose to take control of our future. Join us and let's take back our financial freedom forever.